We come once again to share not only in worship, but to share in our prayer life. To share ourselves with our God and to lift up that relationship. I've already shared with you, and I want you to include in your, our, your prayers, our prayers this morning, you know, Holly, Aaron, and Sarah, uh, and, and ask blessings upon Holly's life. Uh, to Carmen and Allison as they become new members here. And then this evening at 6 o'clock, uh, Scott and Caitlin, uh, Scott Hall, our, our intern, now full-time youth person, uh, they will be united in marriage at 6 o'clock this evening. Uh, they will share the vows of that covenant. And as we pray today, both together and in your prayers, let's lift up Scott and Caitlin as they begin uh, their new life together. On front of the announcement uh, bulletin that you have in front of you, there are a, list of, uh, a whole list of names of folks uh, who need our prayers for various reasons. Some, some are health-wise, some are personal, some are celebrations. I invite you to take that home, magnetize it to your, to your refrigerator, or, or put it on your bedside table. Lift that up and pray for those people uh, in the week to come. Let them know that, that you care enough to pray. Okay? Any, any other celebrations, prayer concerns we're missing? Anything new? Six more? Uh, yes. Your son Clint is going to be a daddy. You know what's even more important than that? You're going to become a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> is Clint here? Nah, your grandma, that's important. There you go. There you go. Okay. Oh, and let's see. Today is June what? We have June 22nd. Next week's the 29th. And we have four Sundays in July. And then your new minister will be here. First Sunday in August. Continue in your prayers to prepare your heart and your soul for when Paul and Valerie and the kids arrive. It will be a great celebration for all of you, okay? Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, here we are, gathered one more time in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We in this part of the country have received what for us is so much rain. The grass is even green. And we give thanks. So on this day, O oh God, hear our prayers of gratitude. And in the midst of creation, O oh God, there is life and there is death. On this day, we come and celebrate life. We celebrate the birth of Holly, all six pounds, three ounces, and 20 inches of her. Hear our prayers for the health of both Holly and Sarah. Hear our prayers for Aaron and Sarah, the new parents. Hear our prayers of blessing for Holly's life to come. Here are prayers for Carmen and Allison as they have come to join this family of faith. May we pray that they will find their unique ways to serve your kingdom through this family of faith. Hear our prayers for Scott and Caitlin as they prepare to exchange the, their vows of marriage.
Hear our prayers for Clint and Karen and the whole family as they expect new life in the months to come. And God, we take a moment and we give thanks for the process that brought this church and Paul together. We give thanks for your presence through your Holy Spirit that was in the midst of it. Hear us as we pray for Paul and for Valerie and for the children as they prepare for this move. May in the weeks, the months, and the years to come, May it prove to be a fruitful relationship for the growing witness to your word. And God, we gather within this world filled with joy and celebration and filled with turbulence and violence and war. And we pray once more for peace. Peace, not only the absence of war, but peace where the hearts of this global community of all our brothers and sisters around the world would lift up that which is love, would lift up that which is positive, even in their own holy words and their own holy books. And God, we come and we pray for those in need. We come and pray for those less fortunate than ourselves. We come and pray for those who are poor and weak and sick and naked and hungry and thirsty. And continue our prayer saying, lead us, O God, inspire us, stir our souls in such a way that we might serve in family promise, in the gathering of food, in the sharing of clothes, in ministries to this community not yet thought. Bless us, O God, as we gather to worship. Bless us as we share our prayers. Lead us, guide us, inspire us. For we pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior. And we all say, Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the 10th chapter of Mark, the 17th through the 31st verses, and there we read these words. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was shocked. And he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. And Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, 
houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May God add God's richest blessing to our hearing and to our understanding. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we come to you this day, and we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls to your word, that it might stir our souls somewhere there inside us that would call us forward to live out the life that you, our God, has called us toward. Bless us and keep us. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name, and we all say, Amen. This first question is going to be really difficult, okay? Got your thinking caps on? How many people are parents? How many people are grandparents? How many of you are oldest children? My blessings upon you, so am I. We are, we, are the, we are the ones who know what true persecution is in this world. Are we not? Huh? How many of us are brothers or sisters? Aunts or uncles? Of course. Can you remember a day when someone you love welcomed a new child into this world. I can remember those four days. I remember the day Kelly was born. I remember the day when Matthew and Tyler and Jolie, when I first laid eyes upon them as we began the adoption process for those three. Those four days are etched in my mind, never to be forgotten. And when I think back on those days, I think of the wonder and the awe, this, this kind of otherworldliness, and the thing that stopped me in my tracks and made me take a deep breath was the awesome responsibility that came into my life those four days. Life was never, ever going to be the same again. And then, and then I remember, I remember the first times that I saw Braden and Caitlin and Lauren and Ryan and uh, Ethan and Kendall. That's all of them, right? all of my grandchildren. And I was amazed again. I was amazed that my children had children. I was thankful that my daughter and my daughter-in-laws were safe and that the babies were healthy, but there was this whole sense of amazement that came once again. Do you remember that in your lives? I don't know if you remember because it was really not reported very heavily, but do you remember about a year ago when the prince and princess of England had a baby? Do you remember that? It was was on a couple of stations. I think a couple of news stations picked it up and the entertainment stations picked it up. I think even ESPN2 had something on the birth of baby George. I remember it. I remember how in our 24-hour news cycle world that it was with us for two or three days solid. I was happy for him. I was happy for baby George. I remember saying a prayer, knowing that he would never want for anything materialistic in his world. Not one single day, not one single hour would he ever want for anything. And I said a prayer for him, and I asked God to bless him and his health, both spiritual and, and physical and emotional. But as I finished that prayer... It dawned on me 
How many other children were born on that day who on the very day of their birth were not going to have enough to eat for even a single day? And where was the hoopla? Where was the reporting? Where were the news cameras for all those folks? When the drought gets bad enough, we see them. When the, when the hurricane is big enough, we see them. When the tornado is powerful enough, we oftentimes see them. But where were the concerns for those babies on the day they were born? There were some scholars a a couple of years back that coined the phrase, God's preferential option for the poor. It was a phrase that described the phenomenon that was found, that is found throughout both the Old Testaments and the New Testaments. God's partiality toward the poor and disadvantaged was the foundation. The poor and the subject of money is one of Jesus' central themes throughout the Gospels, especially in Mark and Luke. The scholars ask, why would God single out the poor for special attention over any other group? And I used to wonder that too. What makes the poor deserving of God's concern? And one day while reading in a magazine, I I received some help on this issue from a writer named Monica Helwig. And she gave the following list of advantages of being poor. The first one, the poor know they are in urgent need of redemption. By the way, this is in your bulletin. Number two, The poor know not only their dependence on God and on powerful people, but also their interdependence on one another. The poor rest their security, not on things, but on people. The poor have no exaggerated sense of their own importance and no exaggerated need for privacy. The poor expect little from competition and much from cooperation. The poor can distinguish between necessities and luxuries. The poor can wait because they have an acquired, a a kind of, of dogged patience born of acknowledged dependence. The fears of the poor are realistic and less exaggerated because they already know that one can survive great suffering and want. Number nine, when the poor hear the gospel preached to them, it sounds like good news and not like a threat or they're being scolded. And number 10, the poor can respond to the call of the gospel with a certain abandonment and uncomplicated totality because they have so little to lose and are ready for anything. Helwig goes on at the end of the article, and she writes, In summary, through no choice of their own, the poor may urgently wish otherwise. Poor people find themselves in a posture that befits the grace of God. In their state of neediness, dependence, and dissatisfaction with life, they may welcome God's free gift of love more openly, more acceptingly, with deeper understanding than perhaps you and I. After I read that and thought about it for a while, I did an exercise. I went back over Helwig's list, substituting the word rich for the word poor and changing each sentence to its opposite. The rich do not know they are in urgent need of redemption. The rich rest their security on things and not people. 
The rich have an exaggerated sense of their own importance and an exaggerated sense of privacy. When I did that, it sounded so harsh. So harsh. But then I remembered Jesus did something very similar in Luke's much less preached version of the Beatitudes. When Jesus says, quote, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. And then I did another exercise. I'm not even sure I want to share this one. But I went back and I substituted the word I for poor. Reviewing each of those ten statements, I asked myself if my own attitudes were more resembled to the poor or the rich. Do I easily acknowledge my own needs? Do I readily depend on God and other people? Can I distinguish between necessities and luxuries? Am I patient in the midst of all that goes on in the world? My dad's from West Texas. I understand you all a little bit, and some of that is in me. And there isn't anything more prideful that we like to say than what? I picked myself up by my own bootstraps, and I made my way. I guess God's in there somewhere, right? Do I readily depend on God or other people? I need a ride to the airport. I need somebody to help me carry something because of this old back I have. And I have this 30-minute conversation with Susie, which always ends. You know, those people you serve, many of them are just waiting to be asked to help you. Can I distinguish between necessities and luxuries? I drive an Avalon and a Lexus. And more than anything else, I want a Shelby Mustang. Necessity or luxury? Am I patient? As long as there's no traffic, (laughs) I don't have to put together the stewardship campaign and the board meetings go without any questions. I'm as patient as I can be. Do the Beatitudes The words of the Gospels sound more like good news or a scolding to me. It's the biggest tension I have as a minister. I think it's the biggest tension for any of us who are are successful or affluent. It is so difficult for us to hear the gospel as good news when we have so little we need. We don't hear it the way people on the margins hear it. We don't hear it the way people who are dependent, life dependent on other people. As I did the exercise where I substituted I for poor, I began to realize why so many saints voluntarily submit to the discipline of poverty, dependence, humility, simplicity, cooperation, a sense of abandon. They are qualities that are greatly prized 
in the spiritual world and spiritual life. There may be other ways to God. But the scripture says this is how easy that is for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle. In God's reversal of God's kingdom, prosperous saints are very rare. I do not believe to be the poor, the poor to be more virtuous than anyone else, though I have found them in my 40 years of ministry oftentimes more compassionate and more often than not more generous than many other people in the world. But they are less likely to pretend to be virtuous. They have not the arrogance of the middle or the upper middle class who can skillfully disguise their problems under a facade of their own choosing. They are more naturally dependent because they have few or no choices when compared to the affluent world. They must oftentimes depend on others to survive to survive. I now view the Beatitudes and the Gospels not as patronizing slogans and words, but as profound insights into the mystery of human existence. God's kingdom turns the tables upside down. The poor, the hungry, the mourners, and the oppressed are the ones that are truly blessed, not because of their miserable states, of course, Jesus spent too much of his life trying to remedy those miseries. Rather, they are blessed because of an innate advantage they hold over those more comfortable and more self-sufficient. People who are rich and successful and beautiful may well go through life on their natural gifts. And people who lack those kinds of natural advantages, hence qualified for success in the kingdom of this world, just might turn to God in their time of need. We as human beings do not readily admit desperation, but when we do, the kingdom of heaven draws near. So when we, when we look, when we read, when we hear this morning's scripture, the question and answer of what must I do to inherit eternal life, to me, just kind of pops off the page. What are we to do to inherit eternal life? We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our body, all our soul, and our neighbors, not just our next door neighbors, but our neighbors in this world as ourselves. And then we are to go and sell all that we have and share it with the poor. And that, my friends, I think all of us find at the very least challenging and at the very most impossible to even consider. Every time I read this list, and God's word, I am convicted. I am convicted. This word of God in the midst of my affluence certainly lifts up and challenges me. It challenges my stewardship. It challenges the way I think about the worth of myself and other people. It challenges the way I live. But more than that, what this story and its questions call me to understand is just exactly, just exactly what is the depth of my trust in Jesus? and God and their presence in the Spirit. 
Because in the end, that's what it's about. In the end, reading this Bible that we say is the guideline to our lives, in the end, it's all about trust. It's trusting and hearing and listening to God's words. It's trusting that God will be there with us, that God is present. It's trusting all of that. And then being willing to live the life that is laid before us. So here's what I want to ask you to do. In the week to come, I want you to take that list home. And on different days, I want you to substitute your name in place of poor. And I want you to think about it. And I want you to read it. And I want you to meditate upon it. And then about the third day, what I want you to do is to take that list. And I want you to substitute First Christian Church in Lubbock, Texas for the word poor. And then in your prayer life, I want you to pray to God, asking God, what ministries are you calling this church to live out and and what will I do what gifts and graces will I share to make that ministry happen I know this is June But August is coming, and so is your new minister. I will share my gifts and my graces as a part of this united family. so that this community will know. Paul, Valerie, this congregation, and its love of God. We all gathered. We had the opportunity to hear. And our prayer is, God, stir our souls that we might hear anew because my friends the bottom line is life comes in this world through birth life abundant comes when we share that love with one another life eternal comes Life eternal comes when we live God's call upon our life and our actions and our ministries. And that's when all God's people said, and all God's people said, and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God.